So, uh, today's lecture, guys, is just going to continue on from yesterday. So, you recall that yesterday we did, um, I think, four or five different modes of stress, and we talked about them all individually and how you would calculate the stress vectors on, a, on an infinitesimal element at the critical zone for each of those modes. Uh, now what we're going to do is I've got a couple of brief slides talking about combining that and how we get um, a combined stress element from all the different modes or at least a couple of different modes simultaneously. Um, and then we've got a, uh, a few examples to go through um, and we'll see how, we, how many of those we get through. Then uh, Monday's tutorial will be you guys having an actual you know, a, a crack at these. Um, next week uh, on Tuesday I'll review more circles so that'll be the next step after this. So we'll start to condense these uh, stress vectors into uh, principal stresses and that kind of stuff to start to think about which one is the actual critical if we've got more than one candidate. Um, and then we'll, we'll start to you know, talk about failure criteria and things after that. So I guess um, the first little example that I'm going to go through here is a circumstance like this. We've got some sort of a sharp, and I'm just drawing a wall at the left hand end, but that could just as easily be some sort of a driving machine or something like that that's connected to it. Um, we've got forces on the end, so we have an axial load, we have a, let's say a transverse load down here that's going to cause transverse shear and bending. Uh, and we also have a torsional load on that. Um, so we're starting to talk about all of those modes lumped in together. Um, as uh, you all be starting to get comfortable with, the very first thing we do in every single one of these problems is to do our free body diagram. And the free body diagram looks like that. And you can see from the fact that we've got Lots of complicated things going on, moments and talks and things like that. It makes life a lot easier to have these talks drawn as that double-headed arrow because uh, it starts to simplify that free body diagram. Um, this is our applied end, so we have our axial, we have our torsional load, um, and this talk, this talk diagram should actually be negative. This is an old sign convention. Um, and we have our force down, and then we have to calculate all of our reactions at the left hand end. Is everyone comfortable? with that free body diagram and calculating those reactions. Don't need to go through it. Great. All right, so axial force diagram uh, is very simplistic. Obviously, we just have even axial load throughout the entire length, exactly the same as the problem we dealt with yesterday. Easy enough. Shear force diagram, that's obviously positive, um, and you'd be able to work that out if you took a section somewhere in the middle there as well, just to confirm. Uh, bending moments. Uh, we have no bending moment to the right and we have our bending moment reaction at the left so that's the same as any of the cantilevers that we've been dealing with thus far. Uh, yep, and so that goes down to negative there. Uh, and then our torque is even throughout the entire length and as I said, um, I didn't catch this until just now but this is from last year um, when we used a different torque sign convention. It's just arbitrary, negative or positive. Um, so the way that you'd be looking at that is that would be a negative torque yeah, throughout the entire length, which is here. Alright, so that's easy stuff. We've got all of our uh, axial force, shear force, bending moment and torque diagram. That's our four different modes of force that are going to be present throughout the entire length. Now looking at that, where do you think that the critical zone might be? Throughout the length. All the way to the wall, yeah. Yeah, so obviously these three are even everywhere, so that doesn't matter. And this one's maximum at the left, so it's pretty obvious to us where the critical zone is going to happen in terms of cross sections. Uh, and now we have to think about what the stress looks like throughout that cross section um, and calculate some uh, possible candidate stress elements. All right. And so uh, pretending like each one of these loadings is largely in a vacuum, uh, we can do exactly what we did yesterday, except and combine them at the end, okay? And so if you look at the top left hand side there, we actually have numbers now rather than just our, you know, pretend letters or uh, variables. So our axial load is even everywhere. And I've just taken four candidate stress elements, top, bottom, left and right. Um, for a circular cross section, that's a pretty good assumption to make. Um, if that was a rectangular cross section, uh, and there wasn't any torsion, 
maybe you just take three down the centre. Um, if for a rectangular cross section, uh, if there is torque, you probably want the four on the corners. So you start to think about where each of those modes of stress is going to be critical and work out some candidate elements that suits the profile. Okay, does that make sense to everyone? So is there a pretty comfortable circular cross section, top, bottom, left, right, chances are you pick up the stress. Um, and please think carefully about that. Don't just, don't just do it arbitrarily. Think about, all right, where's our axial? Our axial's even everywhere. Where's our bending moment maximum? Top and bottom. Where's our torsional? Around the entire outside. Where's our transverse shear across the middle plane? Have I got enough elements to capture all of those critical areas? And in this case, those four will capture that. Okay? So, axial top left is everywhere. So, all four of our elements have a nice even stress. Uh, stress equals P on A, P being uh, 13 kilonewtons. Everyone should be super comfortable with the fact that that's 13,000 newtons. And almost always, I will get you to work in newtons and meters. Try and try and get, so don't put 13 into the equation and then have kilonewton meters and all that kind of stuff. It's just, just really painful to, to go to convert and get your stress correct if you do that. So bring everything back, when you put it in an equation, bring everything back to newtons and meters regardless of how it's written. You, know? you can do newtons and millimeters if you're really comfortable working newtons and millimeters if you mega pascals. Uh, it's up to you, you guys can do whatever you want, but it's really easy to make a screw up and put one metre in one place and a millimetre in another place and completely ruin your units and change all your values. All right? So if, if you get into the practice of just being consistent and every time using newtons and metres, then you will get the right answer every time and you know, become familiar with it. So, newtons, metres, the result is pascals, 6.62 by 10 to the 6 pascals, which is obviously a megapascal. Alright, so 6.62 megapascals is our axial load, which isn't all of that much. Um, now, arbitrarily we can choose whichever, but um, our axial force, shear force diagram, any moment diagram, torque diagram is the order of the diagram, that's the order of the stress I've calculated here. Transfer shear, we know it is zero at top, bottom, and maximum in the centre plane. Um, and you can use any of those modes that I talked about, either visualising or shear force diagram or whatever you want to get the direction of those vectors. Please confirm that they're going the right way. In the centre plane, they're going down, and 4 on 3, B on A is our equation for that. Sub in numbers, and we've got uh, 1.77 megapascals. Cool. Uh, bending stress, it's bending down, so tension on top and compression on bottom. Nothing in the middle plane, obviously, so that's why I have to do that. MC on I, and I've thrown some values in, and so I've got 42.37 megapascals. Let's pause for a second. Look at the magnitude of that stress compared to the magnitude of transverse shear. So whenever you have a load that causes bending, you will have transverse shear and then bending stress, unless you've got that um, real bending case that we were talking about yesterday with the two loads down, two loads up, and the, the no shear in the centre. For every other circumstance, when you've got a bending load like this, you'll have bending and transverse shear. And then look at the difference in magnitude of those two values. Right. Have I said to you yet that one of the assumptions we're going to make on these is that transverse shear is less than bending? I haven't said that yet, no. So we're going to do that on an example in the very near future. The reason is, is that bending moment is almost always each bigger than transverse shear. The only exception to that is when a beam is very, very short. So on the order of the same length as it is high. At that point, the transverse shear starts to become more than the bending, and you need to, you know, maybe you consider the middle plane rather than the top bottom plane. So that's an assumption that we're going to use in the future to save us doing all four of these stress elements. If we can say transverse shear is less significant than bending, then I might only need to do one stress element and calculate from there. But that's something I'll talk about in the example. But I just wanted to flag to you, 42 megapascals compared to one or almost two megapascals. That's a very big difference. And showing you that bending is much more critical and tends to result in much more stress than the same or the related transverse shear. Alright, now last one's torsion, we're going in around the circle, down, um, shear faces, yeah, RJ gives us 1.37 megapascals for that particular force. 
Okay, and then you see where we're going here. Now I've got all of my stress vectors on those four cubes. <coughs> and we add them together. Alright, and we add them together if we look at that top cube. At the top of these we have an axial load, that is his tension. From transmission we have nothing, from bending we have tension, and from torsion we have one going off to what is your right. So, so you can see, see on the top, top left hand side right there, there, just to uh, kind of make it even more clear to you, I've drawn two in tension and one shear. And, and so, so obviously the two tensile and normal forces add together. When they add together over 48, and then one shear is 9.3. Same, Same thing for each of those other elements. elements. So, so one on the, <coughs> what is your height? We have the axial height still. Yeah. We have the transmission goes down, nothing from bending. So, so when we look, look at the right arrow, we've got two shears down, down an axial, two shears down, add to 11.114 megapascals. And the axial is correct. Yeah. 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 Is, is the net, net effect going to be up or down, or down between those the left hand and the right? Up. Up. Because obviously the torsion is up and torsion is lighter than the transverse shear. So don't make that mistake, just make sure that you get the, get the right direction and the right adding and subtracting. So once they add together on the left hand side, we get up and we get 6.62 for the tension, the normal stress is 7.66 for shear. The bottom line, we have axial out, nothing transverse, bending in, and then we have torsion going to the is our yeah. normal stress going to be tension or compression as a result of the axial of the bending? Compression, the bending is bigger. It's easy enough. Alright, All right, so that's what we've done there. And so, so they subtracted. So you see that's a 35 and that's a 48. So, so just, just looking at which of these elements do you think would be more critical? Top one? Yeah. yeah. In this, in this yeah. circumstance, it's really obvious. That, that, that top one has 48, 49 megapascals, plus or minus 10 megapascals, and none of the other ones even come close. This, this one's the only one that comes close that has the same shear or less than the normal stress. So um, we know already without bothering doing any of our, um, let's say, more circles and normal stresses, sorry, principal stresses or bottom ones, because we know which one of these is going to be the more critical. Right. And then we just need to calculate those values to compare them to a value criterion that we're not going to teach you. Right. Right. In, in some, some circumstances, the adding and the subtracting of these stresses as we can find them won't be so simple. You, you might get one, so if we had this one with a really small tensile, but that shear was like 60 megapascals. And then you're comparing that with 48 as a small shear. You don't, you don't really know whether the shear is going to be more important than the normal stress, or the normal stress is going to be more important than the shear stress, and it's not obvious to us which one of those is the most critical. And which point when all, all those other more circle, normal stress, uh, sorry, principal stress, etc., those techniques will tell us which one of those is the more critical. And in that circumstance, when you analyse it, you will have to do either maybe two candidates or four candidates for that particular section, these stress elements, and then do the full calculation to work out which one. If, if it's obvious, obvious from the, the very, very beginning, beginning and in this, this circumstance, I probably almost say that it is obvious because the only thing in the middle section there that is different from the top and bottom section is that you've got transverse shear there and you've got bending in the top and bottom. And if we make the assumption that bending is more critical than a transverse shear, then I'm automatically saying that instead of having to analyze those four, I only have to analyze two, top and bottom. And if I'm analysing two at the top and bottom, I know that the bending is going to be the same, but opposite, the torsional stress is going to be the same. So really, I only need to analyse one stress element. Right. So when you solve this in an exam, if you actually give me a good rationale and give me a sentence that explains why you chose that element, then you can analyse one. You can save yourself a lot of time, and it's really convenient. But you need to understand why you chose that one. You can't just choose it one. Okay. So, so I'll show you all four because this is how it works, works but when you, when you get, get comfortable, comfortable with this, this you can choose one by itself. Alright, any questions on that?
for you guys both. Really? really, it's just what you did in the last lecture, except you know, we're doing multiple and, and just adding and subtracting. Really, the complexity is making sure you get your vectors in the right direction and the, the you know, add and subtract and don't make a silly error there. Um, because when you're rushing in a quiz or something, it's, it's easy to make a mistake. Alright, All right, so, so um, I've, I've got a couple of examples for the rest, rest of the uh, class. We're going to have a go at and do some writing. Uh, but the first example is in uh, English units. Imperial units. Hands up who's comfortable with pounds and inches. I'm going to get a yeah, real comfortable with pounds and inches. Uh, the textbook for this subject, about half the problems in it are pounds and inches. Okay. And I will give you at least half the problems in the tutorial in pounds and inches. So. so Let's have, Let's have a, a refresher. SLA SLA units. units. And, and these are the units that we're going to actually operate in uh, in terms of you know, meters, newtons, rather than kilonewtons and millimeters or something like that. Alright, All right, so I've put this on the slide because the next slide is this exact format except for uh, English units, imperial units. Okay? So obviously distance and meters is very easy to calculate between a kilometer and a meter. Forces in newtons, and we oftentimes will be given things in kilonewtons, but we'll always uh, put that into equations as newtons, so that we don't have to somehow carry that 10 to the 3 through the calculations. Weight is always in kilograms, um, and obviously you know every gram is in kilograms. Pressure and stress is always newtons per meter squared. Right? It's just force over an area. You guys know that, you're very comfortable with that, hopefully. So when you calculate something and you can actually do an, uh, a unit analysis on any sort of equation that you do, you should always boil out newtons per meter squared and then know that that's a stress or a pressure. Um, everyone's familiar with 10 to the 3 pascals or newtons per meter squared in a pascal. Uh, 10 to the 3 is a kilopascal, 10 to the 6 is a megapascal, 10 to the 9 is a gigapascal. This stuff's not new. People in this class get megapascals and gigapascals mixed up constantly. Okay? So you guys need to, again, I'll come back to that attention to detail. Don't screw up your megapascals and your gigapascals. And when you put something into an equation, make sure you choose a 10 to the 6 or a 10 to the 9. When we do things like Young's modulus, that comes in gigapascals. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and so a lot of the time I'll give you something in gigapascals and then on a quiz you'll rush off and go something by 10 to the 6 and just calculate it. You'll be a thousand shy for the entire calculation. If you see gigapascals, put a big yellow highlighter on it or something. You just remember that that's 10 to the 9 because it's such an easy mistake to make and it will ruin your entire solution. Um, um, torque of bending is always in newton meters, and power is in newton meters per second. That's one that people haven't had as much familiarity with. Power. Um, so a watt is a newton meter per second, um, and a thousand watts is a kilowatt. Chapter one goes through power pretty effectively in our textbook, um, and so if power scares you, we will be doing power. We we'll do to do gear trains. Uh, if power scares you, please read that chapter. Alright, so, right, that's so that stuff obviously, obviously everyone's across. These, These are the units that we're going to be working in in English units, also called imperial, also called British units, um, and any other incarnation thereof. Uh, distance that we work in is inches. Alright, you might be told things in feet, and obviously 12 inches to the foot. Does everyone know, everyone familiar with 12 inches equals a foot? Yeah, cool. Uh, three feet equals a yard. Probably won't be yards too much, uh, unless you're dealing with maybe civil documents and things like that for civil infrastructure. And 500, uh, sorry, 5,280 feet to a mile. That one I don't expect you to remember. You can just look that up. Um, and 1760 yards to a mile. So those, those two are not really important. 12 inches to a foot are very important because oftentimes you need to be calculating back to inches. Information. Yeah. All right. All right. So, force, force and weight. One of the confusing things with British units is they're both pounds. Uh, sometimes, if you're lucky enough, you get uh, LBF for force and LBW for weight, but oftentimes it will just be pounds. 
Okay, and so you'll need to interpret in the question what they're actually talking about. It should be, you know, pretty straightforward regardless of what happens. What does PSI stand for? Pounds per square, square inch. inch. What would the equation, equation not pounds, pounds per square inch look like? Pounds divided by inches squared. Yeah. Pounds, pounds per square, square inch is the equation yeah. to calculate pounds per square inch. Pounds per square inch. That's where it came from. Okay. Now I highlight that because oftentimes people have been using the, the phrase pounds per square inch for you know their whole life and not even realise that that's what it actually means. Okay. So if you're, if you're confused as to whether you're using feet or whatever in this equation, pounds per square inch is a square inch. Use it. Yeah. Good. Hopefully I don't need to say it any more times. KSI is just a thousand psi. K, kilopascals, kilo newtons, kilograms. K is just a, a thousand psi. So they could just as easily say K psi, but they drop the P because they're lazy, so you know, a thousand. Right, so if you get something in KSI, make sure you sure always boil it back to PSI for the calculations. Right, to get something in feet, make sure you always boil it back to inches for the calculations. Right, right. Right. It's, very, very it's very, very simple. simple. If you do the, the fundamental stuff every single time. So inches, pounds, and you get pounds per square inch. Torque and bending? What's our units for torque and bending in SI? Newton meters. Newton is a force, meter is a distance. So force, distance. Force in this case is pounds, distance is inches. So it's pound inches. It's exactly the same, it's just whatever, you know, you replace one for the other. Apples for apples. Powers. Pretty crazy, but 33,000 feet pounds per minute is a horsepower. Okay, that was, that was a bit screwy, but we'll deal with that with um, you know, with uh, new trains. Unfortunately enough, you get to bring quite a cheap, so it's not a problem. Uh, but that, that one's the only one that, that really makes you spin a little bit. Um, British, British units are stupid, they, they, they don't make a lot of sense to us when we're looking at comparing it to our site. But you guys, as engineers, will able to deal with them and so you need to get comfortable with it. It is an apples for apples replacement. So any equation I give you that you can put metres and newtons and pascals in, you can put inches, pounds and PSI in and it would work exactly the same. Every single equation that we use for engineering, aside from some of the power stuff that actually needs horsepower because you have those 33,000, this and the other in it. So they're, they're slightly different. How is the only exception to the rule that any equation you have that works for SI works for English units as well? Okay. You just need to make sure you keep in, you know, inches and pounds as many sweet. Any questions? Any questions on that? No. No. It's, it's you know, you, know, you, haven't, you haven't done it before. It's unfamiliar, therefore it's scary, but it's, it's super simple once you've done it a few times, which is why we do it a few times on this subject. All right. All right. So what the full question is 
is asking it to do is the magnitude and orientation of maximum shear stress in the one inch diameter section. Now you need more circles to be able to do that and calculate the maximum principles, maximum normals. What we're going to do today is the first part of that. Uh, the critical stress element. And we could even say the critical applied stress element. Alright, so they're the applied stresses. They're not the maximum principles, they're not the maximum shears. They're just the applied stresses and you need to rotate that element around until you get to you know, the maximum of this side or the other. I might draw the schematic out this side so I have a bit more room. Alright, so axes, always, always, always draw your axes, x, y, z, especially for this one because we'll be moving stress elements around and so we really need to know where our coordinate system is. <coughs> Alright, so we have a pulley. So we have the internal diameter, so this small diameter, that sh diameter of the shaft, diameter of one inch, diameter of the hole pulley is six inches, the force which we're told is 2,000 pounds, uh, and this bit of shaft, obviously not drawn the scale, is two inches long. Transverse shear. That's not to say that transverse shear doesn't exist. 
it just to say that the elements that the transverse shear is on aren't the same as the elements that the bending moment is on, and so it's the elements that the bending moment is causing stress on that we're going to analyse. What's another assumption that we make every single time? Weight. Weight, yep. Weight is negligible.
centre there, we've got the force down there of 2,000 pounds. What do I have at the centre? Just in the positive coordinate 
different directions. So we have an X translational, we have a Y translational, and we have a Z translational. Alright, and then we'll call that reaction in the X, reaction in the Y, and reaction in the Z. Alright, and so those three will be our sum of the forces in the X, sum of the forces in the Y, sum of the forces in the Z. And then we have three rotational. And those three rotational will be about or around each of those axes. And I can draw silly loopy arrows like this and it will make no sense to anyone. So what I'm going to do is we'll draw better arrows. I'm going to call this one the moment around the x-axis, which is any rotation this way. Have I got any rotation in that plane? What axis is our torque going around? Yes. Yes. So, yes, I do have rotation in that plane. Um, and so I'm going to have a rotational reaction in that plane as well. Next one. I'm going to follow the Y. Double headed arrow of the Y. And let's call that M in the Y. It doesn't need to be M, it could be you know, rotational reaction or something like that. But we're just calling M in because that's something we can call it. Now, this is around this way, which is effectively, if this was a shaft, it's moving like this, any sort of rotation around that. Do I have any rotation in that plane? No. So I should expect, once I do some of the forces, some of the moments for that to be zero. And rotation around the Z axis. Let's call it MZ, which is rotating this way. Which means my shaft should be moving up or down like this. Do I have any rotation in that plane? I do. So I would expect that to be non zero. So I could just put a little, I expect that to be non zero. I expect that to be non zero. I expect that to be zero. Reaction in the Y, I expect to be non zero because I've got a force up and down. Do we have any forces in the Z other than this one? No. So that should be zero. Do I have any forces in the X other than this one? So that should be zero. Alright, so. We, we do that automatically a lot of the time. But if it's really complicated, you might need to do the equations, the full, full form of equations to calculate these. So this is just what our possible reactions in 3D are. Length, what's the length of our little section here? Two inches. 
and positive as well. Wait, 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 wait.
Air Force, um, and two talk, uh, and even everywhere, and then moments, obviously, maximum at the wall, which is what we expected right from the very beginning. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.